Ah, climate change and global warming. I've done quite a few videos on this topic already, but there's always more to talk about. There's a reason I don't do videos on this topic that often, partly due to the fact that it's difficult to find good content out there, but also due to the fact that it makes me more angry than usual. Nonetheless, some of you guys were requesting me to do more videos on climate change, so here we are. I found this video a while ago talking about the graphs of climate change and why they are deceptive propaganda. We likely won't be going over the entire video since there is something else I want to address towards the end. But anyway, when you come across a climate change denial, or someone who claims that climate change is not detrimental, and they're presenting a graph that either shows the CO2 concentration of Earth's history, or a graph that tries to show that CO2 and temperature doesn't have a correlation, make sure you remain skeptical and check the sources for those graphs. Because what I notice is that a lot of the time, the graphs are either taken out of context or are just flat out faked. Not saying that that's necessarily the case for this video, it's just something to keep in mind. Alright, let's begin. Climate change alarmism is accomplished with visual tricks and deceit. And I'm going to show you how they accomplish it to create a false narrative that claims carbon dioxide is rising at crazy levels never before seen in the history of our planet. Okay, so maybe there are people out there that preach man-made climate change to be worse than it actually is. And maybe there are people out there that lie about the detriments of climate change. I suppose that's what you mean by climate alarmists. However, it's important to distinguish between the media and these people from actual scientists. The thing is, the scientific community can be quite closed off sometimes, and this is one of the things I don't particularly enjoy about the community. If you're not a scientist in that particular field, it can be quite difficult to understand what these scientists are saying. When scientists write papers, they're not particularly friendly towards the and I. As a result, the way their information gets to the public is through other forms of media, such as science popularizers, which may very well easily distort some of the things that science originally said, either for the purpose of pushing a narrative, or it could be just that the things need to be simplified. Either way, the result is that it is difficult for the common people to read and understand the primary sources, so they usually have to rely on secondary ones which may not be as accurate. This point I am making here isn't going to be too relevant to this video, but it is something important to keep in mind. Make sure you distinguish between the narrative that some people push apart from the claims of actual scientists. First, take a look at this chart labeled atmospheric carbon dioxide. This appears to show that CO2 is rising dramatically. What do you mean it appears to show? It is showing that CO2 is rising dramatically. At the end of the day, you can nitpick all you want, but it's the rate of CO2 increase that matters, not necessarily the absolute CO2 concentration. But let's hear what he has to say about this graph. I'm going to let the clip play on for a while since this is a long point he's making. It's already over 400 parts per million. Look at this chart. Starting in 1960, CO2 levels are very low. It looks like, visually, it's almost near zero, right? But now it's skyrocketing to the top right portion of the chart. It looks alarming, doesn't it? And this is what the climate change narrative is based on. Alarming deception in these charts. What if I told you that this was highly deceptive and visually dishonest? To see that, first take a look at the vertical axis on the left-hand side. Notice that it doesn't start at zero. It starts at 320 and goes up to 400. So what you're only looking at is actually kind of a zoomed in vertical section, almost a row of the chart. You're not seeing the real chart. Now, we're gonna zoom it out for you and give the axis zero to 400 so you can see where this chart actually rests on that entire axis, the full range of numbers. Now, when we zoom out, we see that in fact, CO2 hasn't risen that much compared to the existing concentration of CO2. Alright guys, take a seat, grab a snack, because I'm about to go on a massive rant about this. I'm sorry if your ears start bleeding after this. You ready? Okay, so there are multiple points to be made from this. I'll start with why that graph is plotted to start at about 300 parts per million. First of all, this is how to properly plot scientific graphs in your paper. The truth of the matter is, graphs can be messy. Any figures can be messy. You open up any scientific paper and you will see that they follow a certain type of format. For example, there's always a caption on the bottom that gives a succinct explanation on what you're looking at. Figures are ordered by letters. Graphs don't have horizontal horizontal lines to help with visualization. Error bars only protrude from the top. These are basic formatting structures that scientists follow, and the rules are quite universal. Of course, that doesn't mean every single paper you find out there will follow these formatting rules, but the vast majority will. The main purpose of it is to make the figures cleaner and easier to read. And guess what? For graphs, if the y-axis value is high, you bet that the bottom of the axis isn't going to start with zero. And this is especially the case for certain graphs such as scatter plots. It is to make it neater and easier to visualize, and is one of the first things you learn to do when writing papers in science 
science college classes. It's not there to deceive you. It's not there to make us seem like CO2 is increasing at an alarming rate. It's following proper scientific format. And when scientists read graphs like these, they are well aware that the bottom of the y-axis doesn't start at zero. In fact, not just scientists, but people of the common eye too. If you're looking at this graph and got a different impression of the data than what was intended due to the formatting structure, then that's on you, not on the people who made this graph. And this brings me to my next point. If the dependent values end up being relatively high and consistently high, it is important to start the y-axis at a non-zero value, because that highlights the importance of its change. Let me illustrate this through an analogy. Let's say we had a patient and measured his blood pressure over time, specifically his systolic blood pressure. On the first day of measure, he started with the average, 120 millimeters of mercury. But as time passed, his blood pressure began increasing until it was at about 140, which by the way is quite outrageously high. Now, this graph I made here is from scratch and I don't really have the proper softwares at home to create a professional looking graph like in the papers. I could do that if I purchased the software or if I snuck in some laboratory to use their computers, but I think this will be enough to illustrate my point. If we started the graph at zero, his pressure increase of 20 may seem very little. You can't look at this graph and say, well see, 20 is a small increase compared to the blood pressure he already has. No, the guy has an incredibly high blood pressure and that is significant. In order to see what this actually means, you'd have to start the y-axis higher to get a better picture of what this increase looks like. It puts it into perspective. Similarly, for your graph that you show us in your video, this increase in CO2 is indeed significant, and zooming out so that the y-axis starts at zero would do it no justice, and if anything, it would just undermine the actual issue. Perspective is important in science. So not only is this formatting necessary to make the graph look cleaner and better, it is also there to help more accurately visualize the pattern of the dependent variable. Alright, let's move on. And even 400 parts per million is very, very low, by the way. Plants all across our planet are actually starving for CO2. And extra CO2 allows plants to grow food more quickly, and it also encourages reforestation, which is good for the planet. Alright, I've addressed this claim already on my channel, but I haven't really talked about it in great detail, so I'm gonna do that now. I hope you have a second round of snacks. Anyone who just says CO2 is plant food and then assume that global warming is good because increased CO2 levels will increase plant mass simply just don't understand plant science. Allow me to explain. Yes, CO2 is a requirement for plants in order to build sugar, correct, but that's not all they need. They're not just simple machines that spit out sugar whenever you give it carbon dioxide, no. They also require water, a system to keep this water, sunlight, a nitrogen source, etc. Simply increasing the source of CO2 isn't going to increase yield if you don't also increase all the other required resources. The nitrogen source, for example. Are you going to go around the entire earth, fertilizing literally every single plant? Probably not. And as for the water source, let me explain to you guys a concept that you probably don't know about plants. See, plants have pores in their leaves, called stomata, which is plural for stoma. This is the primary mechanism in which plants obtain carbon dioxide. Once these pores are open, oxygen and carbon dioxide can freely move. Now the thing is, O2 and CO2 aren't the only things that are exchanged during the opening of the stomata. Water is also a major molecule that moves through these pores, specifically outwards as water vapor. So this is a trade-off plants have to deal with, especially for those living in hot or dry conditions. If you open the stomata, you will receive more CO2, yes, but in the meantime you will also lose water in the form of transpiration, which means plants usually never keep its pores open at all times, but rather would open it intermittently in order to reduce this water tax it has to pay. This rate of H2O loss is heavily dependent on many factors, and temperature is one of them. When temperature increases, the rate of transpiration also increases, meaning plants lose more water for the same amount of time they keep their stomata open. Now imagine the future where humans don't stop emitting carbon dioxide into the air. Yes, there will be more CO2 in the air, which is the fuel for photosynthesis, but the CO2 also leads to higher temperatures. And like I mentioned earlier, higher temperatures means plants lose water much more quickly during any time when their stomata are kept open. As a result, plants would respond by not opening their stomata as often. They will spend more time keeping it closed in order to minimize this increased water tax. And guess what happens as a result? You guessed it. Plants will absorb and utilize less carbon dioxide due to their stomata being closed for a longer period of time. Unless you are somehow able to provide plentiful water to all plants in the earth so that they can ignore this increased water tax. In the short run, maybe carbon dioxide would increase plant yield by a minimal amount, but as temperature increases, more and more plants would not only keep their stomata closed for a longer period of time, but may also start dying due to this temperature increase. That's why if you look at graphs with CO2 versus photosynthesis rate, it eventually just plateaus. Now I'm generalizing a little here. In reality, different plants behave differently. I'm looking at you, cam plants. Now more importantly, this isn't the only phenomenon out there that says increased CO2 levels won't increase plant yields. We're talking about many other major problems, like heavier precipitation that carries nutrients away from soil and into the oceans, resulting in less plant growth, and increased desert area which force plants to migrate into less favorable conditions. But these are topics for another video. Now let's zoom out on the time scale. Let's go all the way back to 1750. As you can see in this chart, it shows that CO2 levels were also 
lower in 1750. And once again, this chart, because it's very selective, showing you a specific time portion and a specific vertical range, appears to show an alarming rise in atmospheric CO2. But again, it's trickery and deceit. Now, let's zoom out on this image and show you zero to 400, it's barely moving up from the level that it was in 1750. Just trickery and deceit is what I see from these climate change deniers. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something new today, and I'll see you next week. Thank you to Fireshard for being the top tier patron this month. Without the support of my patrons, what I do would not be possible. Thank you so much.